you know, the way a lot of Democrats and liberals um, speak about coal mining in West Virginia is often in a way that's like very degrading and, you know, understanding that obviously because of climate change, we need to, you know, transition away from fossil fuels. If you were kind of the head of the Democratic Party, um, how, how should the Democratic Party speak about that issue specifically? Because it's one that, you know, it just is so top of mind to a lot of people, but the, the way they, they kind of speak to it is often, is often, I find, counterproductive. You know, as much as the people in Appalachia have paid the price for when you turn on your light switch, like I said, it's, it's, it's because of the blood of Appalachians that we fueled this country. Mm-hmm. And we have gotten to the point in Appalachia, we're not asking, we're demanding that we have economic diversity and we have federal funding to go into states like ours so we can diversify our economy. There's so many things that you can do. Uh, we can invest in renewables. If we legalize and decriminalize cannabis, which we know it's just a matter of time that it's going to happen on a federal level, and absolutely I'd stand behind that, but I hope states in Appalachia get behind it because we would see economic growth within six to eight months. There's a lot of potential for geothermal. I know specifically in West Virginia, we have a lot of hot spots here. This is the birthplace of rivers. We have a lot of dams. There's a lot of potential for hydropower. Um, if we had comprehensive broadband, which my opponent always talks about, she wants to privatize it and sell us off to the highest bidder. And we've seen that doesn't work. We've seen companies get state and federal funding and end up spending that money out of state. Um, Capito Connect, it really shows how disconnected my opponent is. You know, it should be a public utility. It ties into, you know, our economic development, our infrastructure, as well as communication and as communications as, and as well as education. We were already advancing into digital learning. And during this pandemic, while they're taking this push and pushing their children back into school, the most vulnerable children are going to be pushed into unsafe working, you know, unsafe conditions, as well as our educators and our school service personnel. Because for one, I don't know a lot of Appalachians that can afford broadband if they had it. And we've created these hotspots across the state where they can download, you know, the things that they need on their iPads. You know, it's going to be cold soon. We don't have rural transportation in a lot of these areas, especially where they're plagued with the addiction epidemic and food deserts. And so what is going to happen is we're going to push those children back into unsafe conditions just because they're poor and they have a lot of things going on at home uh you know we had if we have good roads good schools good bridges adequate sewage systems etc 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 we can invite business to appalachia and business will want businesses will want to come here but if we're not even you know our most valuable resources are people first and foremost but people are not going to want to settle here if they don't have access to broadband you know people sewage is running into the rivers and streams and if you know we don't have access to clean water and clean air they do not want to move into communities when we're dealing with one of the largest addiction epidemics in the country um it's just the possibilities are endless but we need people that are going to be visionaries for our future instead of visionaries for our demise and you know first and foremost we hear about all these bipartisan efforts but it's bipartisan efforts to cater to corporations and lobbyists instead of you know taking care of the most vulnerable in our society and this state has been proven to be very vulnerable with with COVID, we rank one of the top. We have a large population of elderly. You know, we have a lot of sick folks with uh, black lung, the addiction epidemic, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, my opponent, uh, she even tried to, she's voted against equal pay for women at least three times. She tried to turn Medicare into a voucher program. She says Medicare for all is Medicare for none. And I'd like for her to explain because that makes no sense because she's still (laughs) catering to, you know, private insurance companies. There's just so many things and the writing is there on the wall. And West Virginians are beginning to see that we are in the fight for our lives and people across the country have invested so much in these campaigns and it's up to us now to vote in people that will actually serve us. I mean, I'll be honest with you. 
I, I love West Virginia. I love to be home. I want normalcy. I fought for years for normalcy, but I'm in this spot for my children and grandchildren and every child in Appalachian in this country. This country girl does not want to go to D.C. And if I'm going to have to go there for six years, I'm going to rake six tons of hell while I'm there. And I'm going to be working when I come back home because this is about survival for us. So what is the transition uh, for coal miners that you envision and that you're going to help fight for? Well, there is no there's no transition now. There's no just transition. You know, people are getting laid off every day. When we talk about economic diversity, if we invest into the Reclaim Act, you know, we don't take things from the you know abandoned mine land fund. Just like the miners' health care and pensions, it's like my opponent painted herself as a champion to get miners' health care and pension. And what it was was one of the biggest anti-union tactics that I think West Virginia has ever seen. We seen the industry file bankruptcy give them you know give the top you know the their ceos large bonuses open up non-union mines and then tap into the abandoned mine land funds and pay for the miners health care and pensions when that was supposed to restructure create job development great regrowth and they did not hold the industry accountable at, for at all. We need people that are going to make these people pay their damn bills instead of giving them bailouts. And that's basically what happened. And they busted zero human coal mines in West Virginia now. And, you know, my, my opponent's not a champion for that. That was one yes vote. And she's for right to work. She wants to close the doors in the union hall. And we have to make sure that unions, the backs of the unions are back into the backs of the workers. And where, you know, workers can form unions and have the right to collectively bargain for things that impact their lives day to day and they can be safe and they can make a living wage. Uh, there's just all these things are so systemic and they're simplistic and it does it's not rocket science but we just have to make sure that we have people that are actually invested and in making sure that people are taken care of. This is one of the richest countries in the world. We do not have a budgeting problem. We have a moral problem that creates a budgeting problem. Yeah, that's what very well put. That's true. And everyone always thinks it's the other way around, right? Like, oh, we would love to. What do you, you know, look, I love that idea as much as you do. We just don't have the money. And that's so important. And actually, I think that's something that, you know, I know that you, one of the things that really put you on the map um, in terms of optics, I guess, was this moment that this really beautiful moment that you and Senator Bernie Sanders shared. Um, I bring him up because he's someone who really wonderfully has made that argument, right? The, mm -hmm. the no, it's not about, um, impo it's not impossible what we're asking for, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We are demanding something that's very doable and we just need to demand it because it's the right thing and it's the doable thing. And the mm -hmm. billionaires have told us for so long that we can't have it, but it's mm -hmm. just because they want to keep the money. Can you just tell people about that interaction that you had with Senator Sanders and how that, um, I don't know, affected you and other people? Well, I was just doing what I always done, you know, and I, I seen this little old man. The first time I seen him was 2016 and he had a rally in Charleston. And he was talking about things that nobody would ever talk about. And I found out he was showing up at food banks and poor counties like McDow McDowell County. And I'm like, wow, a presidential candidate is showing up at a food bank in, a, in the middle of nowhere. And um, I was writing off ads to national media. And Diane Seamus with the Chris Haynes show said, I don't know if we can get you on a panel, but Bernie Sanders is coming up. You know, would you like to come and possibly speak? Well, I didn't get on the panel, but you know, me being the honored Appalachian woman, I'm like, I am not leaving the space until I talk to this guy. So I walked up to him and I'm like, Senator Sanders, I'm calling Gene Swearinger, blah, blah, blah. Can I have two minutes of your time? So I followed him from the front of the room to the back of the room, back to the front of the room with him signing autographs and everybody giving him hugs and media trying to talk to him. And the amazing thing was he threw his hands up and he said, stop. I told this woman that I would talk to her. And then it moved into me crying like a baby because one, you know, most of the time, especially like with my incumbent, you have to get arrested in her office to be heard or people are flying paper airplanes demanding health care over the top of her door because she's so inaccessible. And here was the senator of Vermont 
that didn't, you know, didn't have to care about West Virginia. We're not a swing state. He was just here because he cared. And I loved about him was also when he wasn't running for president, he was still back at food banks. He was still standing shoulder to shoulder with us. And, you know, we've seen this change in this political dynamic across the country where ordinary people were standing up and he was saying, I can't do this forever. I'm not a hero. Y'all need to do something for yourself. And I'm like, he's right. 